everyone. Uh, really sad that I wasn't able to make it in person. Unfortunately, caught COVID late last week and still recovering from that. Um, but yeah, there should be opportunities for questions at the end if you have any. Uh, so I'd like to start off this talk with some motivation around what robots can do today. And um, in some of uh, my recent research uh, and, and research in my lab and in collaboration with others, uh, we've looked at whether robots can perform really challenging, fine-grained, dexterous manipulation tasks. Uh, and one work from a little over a year ago now, uh, we were looking at teleoperation uh, for really challenging bimanual tasks. And uh, with this kind of puppeteering-like setup, we found that we were able to train policies to do fairly complex, precise tasks like tearing off a piece of tape and putting it on a box and putting a shoe on a foot. Uh, then we tried to take that a step further. And instead of just looking at um, fine dexterous manipulation tasks on uh, a two-arm platform, we looked at what about mobile manipulators? And uh, we developed a teleoperation system for uh, this mobile two-arm uh, platform, which we called Mobile Aloha also with a mix of puppeteering and uh, kind of in some ways kinesthetic teaching or pushing the base around for full body control and teleoperation. And we also found that uh, we were able to use this to collect demonstration data and then train autonomous policies with imitation learning to do, again, really complicated tasks uh, involving full body control. On the bottom, there is uh, putting a pot into uh, a cabinet and on the top, there's cooking a piece of shrimp. Uh, and these were some of the most complex tasks that uh, we've trained robots to do to date. Uh, and beyond mobile manipulators, uh, we also, uh, in collaboration with some folks at Johns Hopkins, also looked at what about surgical manipulation tasks. Uh, and uh, in some ways, the Aloha and mobile Aloha systems were inspired by the Da Vinci surgical robot, uh, but of course at a, a much, much, much smaller cost. And uh, again, we found that uh, if you collect demonstrations on this platform and um, train uh, with imitation learning, you can uh, get policies that can actually do pretty complicated things on this platform, including tying a knot uh, and picking up a needle uh, with various distractors. So one of my takeaways from this is that if you can teleoperate a robot to do something, then very likely the robot can actually learn it. Uh, and I think that that's actually fairly powerful because it suggests that uh, if we want a robot to be able to do uh, a particular task, then we should, uh, if we can find a way to teleoperate it, then, um, then we have a path towards that task being kind of solved uh, in some sense of the word uh, for, for that task. So, um, I think that that's one takeaway. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of really challenging open problems. And a couple that I wanted to highlight is that first, there are systems where it's really challenging to do teleoperation, uh, such as um, if you have like humanoid systems that you want to control the whole body of, then teleoperation is very difficult. Uh, and second is uh, even if we can train a policy to do one task in one scenario, actually getting policies that are robust to lots of different scenarios, distractors, different environments and so forth remains really challenging. And so these are the two things that I'd like to talk about today. Can we advance teleoperation and can we look at training generalist policies? Um, so this first one, let's let's look about, um, let's talk specifically about teleoperation for humanoid robots. Now, um, I guess it's some background before we dive into developing like a teleoperation system for humanoids. Um, it's worth acknowledging that there's a lot of prior work on uh, on trying to control humanoids, including uh, with model-based control. Here is um, a video on the left on the Atlas robot, uh, and also using SimDoreal by training a policy in, purely in simulation with reinforcement learning, and then transferring the policy to the real world. Uh, despite these successes and, and the kind of the really impressive progress we've seen from these kinds of robots, uh, techniques in model-based control remain uh, somewhat brittle to different circumstances. And for approaches that 
try to use entire sim to real transfer with reinforcement learning, you often learn policies that are task specific. And uh, in this particular case, it's relying um, very heavily on pose estimation of, um, of objects in the environment rather than learning um, from, from actually from camera images uh, and other sensors on the robot. Um, so one motivating factor is that uh, humans have a lot of general skills. Maybe we can uh, kind of transfer from human behavior directly to humanoids. And if you try to just take um, kind of train a policy on humans and directly apply that to humanoid, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, there is kind of different actuation strength mechanisms, responsiveness and so forth between humans and humanoids. There also are some differences in morphologies, like the number of degrees of freedom, the length of different lengths of a person versus a humanoid, height, weight, and so forth. Um, there's also different parameters um, and mechanisms for being able to see. And uh, of course, gravity can play um, a large role in terms of uh, needing to be able to balance and um, stay upright and so forth. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to try to actually train a shadowing policy uh, and then use that for a teleoperation um, instead of trying to directly mimic human data and directly copy joints from human data. And the way that we're going to do this is um, we'll take uh, the AMOS data set and retarget it to uh, kind of the, the human poses and the hand poses to our robot. Then what we can do is in simulation, we can train a policy that uh, conditioned on the retargeted pose, basically the desired pose that we want the robot to accomplish. Um, we'll train a policy to try to match that. And that isn't trivial because it needs to try to match that while also not falling down um, and obeying various physical and dynamic constraints in the environment. And so we'll do this with reinforcement learning. And um, again, there's a, a policy that's trying to match any input pose that is provided to the robot. And uh, specifically, we'll train an architecture that uh, uses a transformer and is conditioned on um, the target poses uh, and outputs the torques to try to match um, the target poses. Cool. Um, so we'll do this in simulation uh, and we'll use domain randomization and simulation in order to be able to transfer this shadowing controller to the, uh, to the real world. And uh, to deploy this, we will basically have an RGB camera that's looking at a person. Um, we'll use existing models for hand and body pose estimation. Uh, and, and these are from these really excellent prior works here. Uh, we'll then retarget the human pose to the robot pose and then use our controller to control the robot to try to match that targeted pose. And so this part is the part that is trained in simulation, um, whereas these other parts are, um, are using uh, like off-the-shelf models um, and run uh, at test time. Cool. Um, so this is the result of that shadowing system. And so um, on the left is the person that the robot is trying to shadow. And we're using a single RGB camera here. And the robot uh, controller, we can see uh, with some delay, is able to follow uh, the human that it's shadowing right here. And what's cool about this is you can actually do lots of different things. It's reactive to uh, the poses that the human provides in real time. And then we can uh, do this for pretty precise tasks, including typing, um, playing a piano, and we can do it for tasks that require full body control. So tasks that require using both hands, um, tasks that require reaching out the arms in front of the robot, which requires a great deal, deal of balance, and also tasks that require um, needing to squat or get up out of a chair and so forth. Um, in comparison to other approaches for trying to teleoperate this robot. Um, we kind of, we tried to teleoperate with a few different other approaches on rearranging objects. And um, shadowing only requires one person. Uh, if you try to use kinesthetic teaching to move the arms, um, it requires multiple people. Likewise for an approach like Aloha or using Oculus controllers. Um, 
only shadowing in comparison to these approaches is able to do teleoperation for the whole body and actually uh, prevent the robot from like falling down, for example, uh, is actively maintaining balance while shadowing. And we also find that uh, we're able to actually teleoperate faster with shadowing than, um, than these prior approaches. So um, generally it's easy to use. It allows full body teleoperation and it's also inexpensive. You only need uh, an RGB camera. Now we also compared the, the shadowing controller to the default H1 controller, which is pretty robust. Uh, and we found that uh, if you apply force in, um, if you apply large forces, the robot is actually able to maintain balance more effectively than the default H1 controller. Uh, and we're also able to um, use it to squat lower than the default controller, jump higher, uh, and to be able to stand up from a sitting position. Cool. Um, so once we have the shadowing system, we can actually then use it to collect demonstrations in the real world for imitation learning. And this means that uh, we can, by, by means of collecting data in the real world, it means that we can also collect data from all of the robot sensors, including real RGB images, um, and uh, with, yeah, with everything that comes with uh, the fidelity of the real world. Uh, and so we're going to collect around 40 demonstrations per task. And then we're going to train a transformer to match the collected demonstrations um, from the shadowing system. So uh, the inputs to the model are uh, two cameras uh, from the head of the robot, as well as the proprioceptive information. We'll pass that into the transformer alongside positional embeddings. And we'll train it both to predict the target poses with action chunking to predict the target poses into the future. Uh, and then we're also actually going to be predicting um, as a regularization, we're going to be predicting uh, the features from future images. Um, we found that this um, helps prevent overfitting, um, especially to the proprioceptive data. Uh, it encourages it to use the image data, which is really important for solving the task. And we found that binocular perception um, can be helpful for depth sensitive tasks. Cool. Um, so here's the, the autonomous policy on the robot for uh, five different tasks. Um, this first task, the goal is to put uh, the can into the basket on the other robot. Here is a jumping task, which is quite challenging to do. Um, here is a folding task uh, for a somewhat low fidelity fold. Uh, but again, this is a task where you actually have to actively maintain balance as you're moving the arms forward, uh, which is somewhat challenging, especially just in a standing, a static standing position. Um, here's a task of rearranging objects into a basket, a precise task of typing AI on a keyboard, and um, a task of kind of giving a, a light handshake to another robot. Uh, quantitatively, we found that the success rate of the autonomous policy on the task is 80 to 100%, so pretty high success rate. Um, we see a 10 to 60% improvement from using binocular vision. Uh, so some tasks we find it to be quite helpful, like folding, folding clothes um, and typing AI. Other tasks it was less important, um, like and intuitively so, like uh, the two robot reading, for example, um, it's a little bit less important to, to have uh, really accurate depth perception. Um, we found that regularization helps for precise tasks. And so if you compare act and hit, um, you see a really large difference for typing AI, which is a pretty precise task, um, and a smaller difference for other tasks. Um, and lastly, uh, a fully open loop policy really struggles to perform this task. And uh, it's reflective of the fact that you do need to, it's important not just to copy the demonstrations, it's uh, you really need to actually react uh, in real time to things that are happening. Cool. Um, so the takeaways for this part is that um, large-scale reinforcement learning and simulation can allow us to train a task-agnostic shadowing policy. And uh, shadowing for teleoperation of, of demonstrations is low-cost, intuitive, and allows us to collect demonstrations that are effective for imitation learning that allows us to learn full body control on the humanoid in the real world, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, also, the code uh, from the project is available online. Cool. So that was um, a step towards trying to advance teleoperation and allow us to collect demonstration data 
for um, for more complex form factors like humanoids. Um, now I'd like to talk about uh, trying to expand the scope and the um, the generalization of policies learned with imitation learning. Um, in the humanoid project and in the other projects that I showed, the policies are kind of narrow in scope. They're trained on one environment for one task. And ultimately, uh, many use cases we might care about a policy that is robust to many environments and can perform many tasks and potentially also be able to control many different embodiments. Great. Uh, so this brings me to give a little bit of background on generalist robot policies. And two works that I was quite excited about were the RT2 policy and the RT2X policy. So uh, first, RT2 uh, was a policy that used a pre-trained vision language model, specifically the PolyX model. And it found that if you take this pre-trained vision language model and then fine tune it on a large amount of robot data, then you get really strong visual generalization. Uh, and specifically, the policy is able to generalize really quite effectively to scenarios with new distractors, scenarios with different textures of, of the background, with different lighting conditions. And it also allows the policy to handle instructions that refer to object categories that the robot hasn't seen in the robot data before. So this result was really exciting to see how you can actually really translate uh, kind of powerful vision language models um, and, and a lot of their uh, knowledge and generalization and kind of imbue that to robots. Uh, and so this was uh, kind of introduced the term vision language action model uh, or VLA model, specifically basically a VLM that's then trained on robot data. And then from there, the RT2X work showed that you can actually train a policy, not just on one robot, um, but also train on many different robot platforms and data sets. So this is using the same architecture and recipe as RT2, but trained on more robot data covering more robot platforms. And RT2X was really exciting in my mind because we actually found that you can send a checkpoint over to multiple labs and actually just have them run that checkpoint on the robot and the policy would actually work better in many cases than the policy that was developed specifically for that robot platform in that lab. So um, from here, one of the things we wanted to study is whether we can take an open source vision language model and match the performance of this really strong RT2X model. And I should note that RT2X is a 55 billion parameter model that builds upon a proprietary vision language model at Google. And we're gonna try to use uh, an open source 7 billion parameter vision language model um, in our work and try to develop an open source vision language action model um, and see what it takes to, to try and develop something that's about as strong as RT2X. So this led to the open VLA project. Uh, we started with um, a 7 billion parameter vision language model with a VIT encoder and LLAMA2 as the base language model. And then we're gonna fine tune it on robot data. So for example, we'll take an image from a robot camera here, feed that into the vision encoder. Then we'll also um, take a language command and feed that into the vision language model as well. This will then produce action tokens, which will detokenize to predict the, uh, the translation and rotation and gripper uh, motion on the robot to solve the task. So getting into some of the details, we started with the Prismatic 7B VLM. Uh, and so this uh, VLM uses a fused vision encoder of both uh, Siglip and Dino V2. We're then gonna project the embeddings to the input space of the Llama language model. And these, uh, these tokens will be passed alongside language tokens from the language instruction into the Llama model, and then uh, output tokens for the actions. Then we'll convert these tokens into the continuous translation, rotation, and gripper position to execute on the robot. Um, this model, we're taking an image and a language instruction at every time step and now putting the corresponding action. So we're actually running this uh, in closed loop. And then 
Prior works found that vision language models, oftentimes you can actually just freeze the vision encoder. We actually found it really important to fine tune the entire model, including the vision encoder end to end on the robot demonstrations. We fine tuned it on 970,000 robot demonstrations curated from the open cross embodiment data set. And uh, these, this is data that covers uh, multiple different robot platforms. And then we trained uh, the, the model on the robot data on 64 A100s for 15 days. Uh, unfortunately, my lab does not have anywhere near this kind of compute. And so uh, we used, uh, uh, this was in collaboration with uh, researchers at Toyota Research Institute, and they were generous enough to provide the compute for this training run. Cool. Um, so those are the details of the model. Uh, we looked at two different evaluations. One is out of the box. How well does the model perform on robots that are representative of robots that are represented in the training data? And uh, we're going to compare to both to open source generalist policies, specifically RT1X and Octo. Uh, and we trained um, the RT1X and Octo are trained on subsets of open cross embodiment, just like open VLA. Um, but the key thing is that they don't use a pre-trained vision language model. Uh, they might use pre-trained encoders, pre-trained embeddings, um, but they're not going to really get all the juice that you get from a large pre-trained vision language model. And then second, with some help from Google, we'll also compare to the RT2X model, uh, which is a, a closed source and proprietary model that's much larger than our model. Um, we're, the robot data covers uh, multiple different, many different robot platforms, but we're gonna evaluate specifically on two of them. One of them is the Widow X robot following the bridge data setup. And another is with some help from Google again, um, evaluating on a Google robot. And then lastly, we're really gonna focus the evaluation on generalization because this is where um, we might expect to see some benefits from using a pre-trained vision language model. Great, um, so in the results, the first thing that we can notice is that the green and red lines, the two VLA models are a lot stronger than the other generalist policies in blue and orange. And so this means that we're getting really strong improvements from VLM pre-training along these different axes of generalization like visual generalization, motion, physical, semantic, uh, and language grounding. And uh, we also see that open VLA is actually stronger than RT2X on average both on the uh, on the Widow X robot by a really twenty percent margin, um, and by a much smaller margin on the Google robot. Uh, this is somewhat surprising, uh, especially because the Open VLA model is a lot smaller than the RT two X model, uh, and it's a little bit hard to attribute very specific design choices uh, for why it might be better because. Um, because we aren't able to run a huge VLA training run multiple times. But there are a couple of things that might be better. Um, one is that uh, the language model likely isn't stronger, but the encoders, the visual encoders, the SIGLIP and uh, Dino V2 encoders, um, that, that, that Fuse encoder might be stronger than the visual encoder from RT2X, which is uh, about a year old at this point. And the second is that there is more robot data that the field has uh, open sourced. Uh, and so we might be getting more juice out of that, that additional data. Uh, we also did a little bit of curation on data from the bridge data set to remove actions that were all zero. And that curation might be adding to a performance as well. Cool. Um, and then beyond just evaluating the model zero shot out of the box, we also looked at whether we can fine tune to new tasks, uh, which is important because we might care about looking at tasks that aren't um, at tasks that are like very different from things that are represented in the training data set. We're actually going to do this on a third robot platform to emphasize the generality of the model. And we'll compare to fine tuning the Octo model, as well as to diffusion policy, a state of the art imitation learning method trained from scratch. And we'll compare to diffusion policy with and without bells and whistles, since there are some design choices like action chunking, using absolute actions and so on that diffusion policy includes, but open VLA doesn't include and could probably benefit from. Great. And then our experiments, we found that on narrow tasks, uh, training from scratch was uh, quite strong, um, especially with uh, the bells and whistles in purple. Uh, and diffusion policy was, was generally performing quite well on these narrow tasks. 
Whereas on more diverse multi-instruction tasks and on tasks requiring visual robustness, using the pre-trained uh, using a pre-trained model is quite helpful, and OpenVLA specifically uh, is able to provide the strongest um, performance when fine-tuned on these tasks in red. Um, so this means that it, is, it suggests that especially if you when you're fine-tuning tasks that might require a little bit more um, generalization or a little bit more ability to handle different instructions, OpenVLA is a really strong contender for using kind of a pre-trained model for these tasks. And then one of the other experiments that we ran is when we did the full training run of taking a VLM and training it on robot data, we didn't find parameter efficient fine tuning methods to work well for that sort of, um, for that training, that part of training. But we did find that if we take VLA and then open VLA and then fine tune it on new tasks, LoRa is quite feasible. And we saw somewhat comparable performance when using LoRa, uh, when we had a third of uh, the VRAM and uh, many, many fewer parameters that we're fine tuning. Cool, um, so the takeaways here is that we have a state-of-the-art robot foundation model that's fully open source. Uh, it outperforms RT2X despite being almost 10 times smaller, and we uh, see efficient fine tuning to new tasks. Uh, the code and the weights are open source on, on Hugging Face, uh, and so we hope that it'll be a useful resource for the community, both um, out of the box potentially, as well as uh, when fine tuned to new tasks. Um, great, so I guess to summarize a little bit, I talked about um, this takeaway of how we can learn a lot of things if we can teleoperate it. And I talked about how we can enable teleoperation for more challenging full body control tasks and talked a little bit about trying to scale data and trying to scale pre-trained models to train more generalist policies that aren't just good at one narrow complex task, but for many different tasks. Um, along, the lanes of along the veins of training generalist policies um, at Pi, we're also uh, looking at how we can scale up robot foundation models to uh, tackle a, a wide range of uh, real world use cases and robot platforms. And um, here are a couple videos of um, some things we've been up to over the past few months. And um, yeah, the like that really highlight the students that led to that that led the work that I presented, um, Zipeng, Chi Ching, and, and Chi led the humanoid work and Mujin, Carl, and Sid led the open VLA work. Happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you for participating. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Maybe you can just, uh, to say fine, you can just go, go to the front and use this mic. Next one. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, why did you use a combination of SecLab and Dino P2 and not either one of the two? Um, I, what was the alternative that you mentioned? Sorry, can you repeat that? You, you said, um, why did you use Siglip and Dino V2 instead of something? It, instead of either one of the two. So you use a both. Yeah. Um, we found in kind of somewhat preliminary in experiments on like a smaller scale version of um, smaller scale experiments, like when we were fine tuning on a single robot data set, a much smaller robot data set, um, we found that that combination seemed to perform the best. Um, but uh, and and certainly the using both, um, we have plenty of data to be able to accommodate the larger model. Um, so yeah, we we ran some smaller scale experiments where we found that to be best. Uh, so mostly an empirical choice. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the great talk. Hello. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the embodiment where uh, those like generous model usually have to be fine tuned before they deploy on the like new robot like embodiment. What do you think about the like challenges in this direction? So you're asking like, what do I think about the challenges of like when you have to fine tune rather than uh, deploy the VLA model zero shot? Uh, I think my question is about the like 
generalization capability of the robot foundation model in terms of embodiment. I see, yeah. So definitely, I think that if you have an entirely new embodiment, I don't think that we can expect the model to work completely like on out of the box on time step zero. I do think that we've seen really substantial like in context learning abilities from foundation models. And I could definitely imagine a future where you can adapt to a new robot platform in context rather than having to fine tune. Uh, essentially, you need to understand how robot actions will affect that robot embodiment. Um, so yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think that there's probably a potential in the future for in-context adaptation. Right now, we definitely just need fine tuning, uh, certainly. Um, and I also think that fortunately, there aren't that many robot embodiments. And typically, it's not that expensive to collect some data on a robot platform. Um, even just like a day of data can go a long way uh, for being able to learn something about that robot embodiment. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, what do you think about the debate between humanoids with two legs and maybe five fingers versus like wheels and uh, two fingers? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think that I think humanoids are cool. Uh, I don't think that um, I think that there's a lot of benefit to simplicity and a lot of benefit to um, yeah, simplicity, low cost, um, and being able to uh, teleoperate a system as well. As we've seen, uh, teleoperating humanoids is definitely harder than teleoperating a mobile manipulator. And, and we saw that in, in our work too, uh, between like mobile LOHA and the H1 humanoid. So I think that ease of teleop and simplicity are, are really not to be underestimated. And Generally, from a practical standpoint, I think I would always opt for um, the things that are simple, especially if they uh, allow for a really substantial amount of capabilities and if they allow for ease of teleop, because ease of teleop will translate into more data uh, and, and data is really useful. Um, yeah, that said, I think humanoids are cool. I also think that in the long run, we should have models that should be able to control any robot embodiment, uh, including humanoids, if we have data for them. Uh, and so we don't necessarily need to pick between any one platform. Thank you. Okay, there's your time limit. We may accept two more questions. Hi. Um, I had a question more on the teleoperation, especially the human eye uh, teleoperation uh, from the camera that was external and getting poses. Um, I know you showed that it was cheaper because you can just do it to one person and it's faster. But um, how much do you think some of the amazing, uh, especially fine manipulation from Aloha and those systems comes from the kinesthetic teaching and the ability to do like really finely control the system. And do you think uh, just using uh, some sort of targeting would really help with those sort of skills because the humanoid skills that you show them more towards the gross end of the spectrum with large objects? Just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that ease of teleop, like I was mentioning in the previous question is is a huge advantage uh, for collecting data. I think that you um, shadowing because of the latency um, and the like, the distance you are from the humanoid and so forth, um, and also the the hand the hand that we're using only has six degrees of freedom, whereas our hands have far more degrees of freedom than that. Um, it, it definitely makes for a less intuitive experience compared to like teleoperating something like mobile Aloha. So. Um, I think definitely we have uh, a ways to go in terms of teleop for humanoid systems. Um, and I think that generally like puppeteering systems, exoskeletons, that sort of stuff where you're actually, you can get like, it seems like you can get really precise motions from that. Um, definitely seem really promising to me. I think we should still do research on all sorts of approaches, of course. Uh, but yeah, I think that like puppeteering approaches uh, in general are um, are extremely promising. Yeah, especially for like really precise tasks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. I had a question about like with like in the initial stages when you start this work, is there like a simulation environment? Do some first 
work with or someone who wants to get started, is there like the smaller scale that they can start right without actually you know, buying a large robot? Yeah, great question. Um, the definitely for the humanoid project, we basically just started. Well, um, I guess for both projects, we like we involved simulation. Um, early on, like uh, we some of our initial experiments for the Open VLA project, we took a simulator and we're making sure that we could like do a task in simulation because if you can't do a task in simulation, you're definitely not going to be able to do a task on the real robot. Um, and so. There are ways to get started with that. Um, we often use like the Majoko physics simulator, which is um, freely free to use. Uh, there's also various benchmarks that have tasks that are set up, like um, Libero is one of them that's fairly popular right now. Uh, and then on the humanoid uh, side of things, we also were starting in simulation as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the Definitely, I, I really like um, using real robots and validating that things work in the real world because if you get something to work in simulation, oftentimes it doesn't work in the real world yet and you have a lot of work to do to get it to work in the real world. Um, but simulations are are quite accessible. And um, in both of these works, we did initial debugging tests and simulation and uh, yeah, before moving things to the real robot. Thank you. Okay, that's, I think, Professor Chelsea.